Good morning. A um, lot of stuff going on in Ideal Park Christian Reform Church again. Um, we're going to start out with our trunk or treats coming up this Thursday. Um, we're going to have set up on Tuesday night. If anybody would like to help us with set up, uh, we'll be decorating in our Halloween theme, you know, like we always do. Uh, we have lots and lots of kids show up for trunk or treat, so we need lots and lots of volunteers, you know, for running the games. We're going to have uh, probably 15, 16 different games, Dave, you think? At least a dozen, okay? I tried to make him work harder, but he wouldn't let me, <laughs> you know? So please, if you can be there to help us Tuesday night or in Thursday night, we would appreciate it. If you want to donate candy... Please drop it off here to the church or bring it with you Thursday night or whatever. We can take all the candy we can get. We like to make sure the kids get plenty when they leave here. Jim's is doing Operation Christmas Child again this year. Uh, there's some boxes out back that they would like you to take and fill out or fill in or whatever. Talk to Jan and possibly Bill too. You know, he probably knows as much about it as Jan does. Okay, um, our council did, the search committee said they wanted Jake, Pastor Jake to come here. Our council has voted that in. Now we need your input. That's coming up November 3 after the church service. Next Sunday after the church service, we will have a congregational meeting and vote to accept him as, call him as our pastor. Um, Julie Van Der Ark is making profession of faith this morning. Um, we're happy to see that. This has been transferred to Oaks. Um, I think he's doing pretty good from what I hear, you know. And then is in Blodgett Rehab. Um, remember our shut-ins, you know. My wife, she's not really shut in, but she's very slow at getting going in the morning, so that makes it hard to get here. Um, my niece in California, um, daughter lives in California. Um, she has a heart problem. Uh, they don't quite know what's going on. She is in the hospital in California. If she... They do all the tests, can't find nothing really wrong, but if she walks from here to the end of the sanctuary, her heart rate will go extremely high. So please be praying for that. Other than that, we have a second offering today for Feeding America. Um, We've got to pay a little bit more on our, our upcoming money there. And him saying a potluck tonight at 4 p.m. here in this auditorium. Pastor Kale. Thank you so very much, uh, Brother Tom. It is good to be with you. Welcome, dear friends, to uh, Ideal Park on this Sunday. Nippy on the outside, but so wonderfully cozy and warm on the inside. And thank you so much for honoring God with your presence and worship today. God is always honored when his people take time on Sunday to come and offer their worship to him. My name is Calvin Campagner from the Byron Center area, uh, former pastor at at Friendship, and also at Providence, and that's the connection with Julie this morning asking me to do this service. Uh, she was a young girl of 10 or so when I was there. Now I'm a bit older than that, but uh, we think back to those good years. But as we're gathered in for worship this morning, these wonderful words from Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter then his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name, for the Lord is good. The Lord is good indeed. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And all God's people say, amen. Would you rise, please, to receive God's greeting. To all the precious people gathered in this sanctuary, the people of God, grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ, his Son, through the power, through the person of his Holy Spirit. 
Amen. And God having greeted you, he would be so honored if you'd share a warm smile and greeting with those seated nearby.
You may be seated. As you perhaps note, uh, looking in the bulletin, this is the final Sunday of October. And in our tradition, this is Reformation Sunday. And that's kind of going to be the theme of the service this morning as we celebrate a remarkable, remarkable faith restored to the church through the Reformation, which we'll learn about this morning. But printed here is a liturgy. And maybe some of you are aware, but um, the Reformed faith is, is, is hinges on five key understandings. What we believe, sola scriptura, scripture alone, out of the Catholic tradition, it was scripture plus the apocryphal books. Those also had authority. We said Christ alone in the Catholic Church, it's kind of Christ, but the Pope has high authority too. And I could go on and on. Grace alone, faith alone, you know, faith plus works, and so on. Um, so our conviction, and we're going to share this together, if you have that before you, um, I'll begin. With sola scriptura, scripture alone. All scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Together. I will bow down toward my holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And now, sola Christos, or Christ alone. He is the image, Christ is, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. That's from Colossians chapter 1. Not together. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Now, solia gratia, or grace alone. From Ephesians chapter 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding together. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if... The How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Sola fida, or faith alone, Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace now with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then, sola Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. Everything is for God's glory, ultimately, our salvation. So whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, together. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. For from him, through him, to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. And God's people say, amen. Let's stand to sing in Christ alone.
May that be our continued testimony, dear friends, until Christ returns or calls us home. We will continue to stand in the power of our God. We come now to our profession of faith service this morning. So honored to do this service. I was asked midweek if I would do this. And as I already mentioned, um, the Vander Arks were charter members with us at Providence Church some years ago when I came there in 1978. Uh, end of year, the major snowstorm of 78. I'll never forget it as we moved in during that time. And Julie, I think we talked before, that's 45 years ago, maybe 10 or something like that. Uh, we were all younger and young at one time. Uh, that's all changed a bit. But uh, God is so good. I would just want to say welcome to the family members. I'm not going to introduce you all, but a sister is here, mother, children, and so forth. Um, thank you for being here for this occasion this morning. She's going to respond to questions and make her vows just a moment. But I mentioned to her that um, I always had people respond a way of testimony or writing out a testimony to three questions in your understanding, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What has he done for you? Why do you love him? Julie wrote some responses and emailed them to me. She prefers that my voice be her voice, but here's Julie's words. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God sent to earth to die on the cross to take away all the sins of those who believe in him. And I believe in him. He is now sitting at the right hand of God, the Father, preparing my place in heaven. What has Jesus done for you? Julie responds, Jesus sacrificed his own life so that I could have eternal life in heaven. He performs miracles in my life. He blesses me daily. Jesus gives me the courage and the strength I need to face the most difficult times in my life. Jesus forgives all my sins. He has wiped the slate clean. And why do I love Jesus? Her words. Jesus is never too busy to talk, to listen, He's available 24-7 whenever I am in need to ask for his guidance in dealing with difficult situations in my life or if I want to share something good that has happened in my life. He is always available. Jesus knows me better than I know myself. He loves me with no strings attached. Jesus makes me feel like I am never alone in this crazy world. Jesus always has my back or in parentheses, or on my six, as they say on NCIS. I had to ask her about that. I had no idea what NCIS was, but she informed me, one of her favorite TV programs. That must be their expression, on my six or on my back. I learned something. She closes. Jesus has blessed me with five children, five grandchildren, so many friends, wonderful family. I cannot be more grateful for all the blessings I have in my life, and I give to my God, I give to my God all the glory. Thank you for responding in the way you did, Julie, to those particular questions. And now I want to direct us to a particular form. Before the elders, she responded to these questions and made her vows there, and now she wants to make them publicly this morning, but I begin... Congregation of Jesus Christ, today we are privileged to welcome into the full life of this church's fellowship here at Ideal Park, one who wishes to confess her faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. When Julie was baptized, God made clear his claim on her as one of his own, and she was received into the church. Now she wishes to share fully in the life of this congregation and of the whole church of God. And so today, she will publicly accept and confirm what was sealed in her baptism. She will confess her faith in the Lord Jesus and offer herself to God as his willing servant. We thank God for having given Julie this desire and pray that as we now hear her confession, he will favor us with the presence, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, 
we pray that as we hear Julie's response to questions, that indeed you will favor all of us with your presence in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this profession. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this daughter. In Christ's name, amen. Julie, will you please step forward here now? I should add, I wasn't even aware of this, but Julie and her family came to Providence back in 78 from this church. Um, I was not aware of that. So in all likelihood, you were baptized here back whenever, and um, now you make your profession here. I think that's rather significant. But Julie, you can face these people it's in the presence of God and these people that you're going to respond now to these questions. Julie, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent to redeem the world? Do you love and trust in Jesus as the one who saves you from your sin? Do you, with repentance and with joy, embrace Jesus as Lord of your life? Julie, what is your answer? I do with all my heart. Do you believe, Julie, that the Bible is the Word of God revealing Christ in his redemption or plan of salvation? Do you believe that the confessions of this church faithfully reflect this revelation of God? I do with all my heart. And Julie, do you accept the gracious promises of God that were sealed to you in your baptism? Do you affirm now your union with Jesus Christ in his church, which your baptism signifies? I do with all my heart. And then Julie, do you promise? Do you promise to do all you can with the help of the Holy Spirit, to strengthen your love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of this church, honoring and submitting to its authority, do you join with the people of God in doing the work of the Lord everywhere? What is your answer? I do, God helping me. I do with all my heart. I do, God helping me. We heard these words. More importantly, God heard those words, Julie. And a verse in the Bible says, the one who confesses me before men or before people, that one I will confess before my Father in heaven, the words of Jesus, your assurance. One day, your name is in the book of life, and he will confess you before his Father as one of his very own. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that I now welcome you to all the privileges of full communion in this church. I welcome you to full participation in the life of the church. I welcome you to its responsibilities, to its joys, to its sufferings. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may this God equip you, Julie, with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And God's people say, amen and amen. And then there's a response here from the congregation. The words, thanks be to God. We promise you our love, encouragement, and prayers. Thanks be to God. We promise you our love, encouragement, and prayers. Let's say it together. Thanks be to God. We promise you our love, encouragement, and prayers. We're going to pause for a song here. It's one of Julie's favorites, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's stand to sing.
refrain one more time. No piano. A cappella, please. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. I didn't know, Julie, but you have a beautiful voice. And um, had we sung that third verse, I think you and I would have done a duet on that one. But um, we got a prayer here that I'm going to conclude, and I'm going to include a few items from uh, within the congregational needs at present as well. Lord our God, we thank you for your word, for your Holy Spirit, through which we know Jesus as Lord and Savior. May the one who confessed your name on this day never cease to wonder at what you have done for her. Help Julie to continue firmly in the faith, to bear witness to your love, to let the Holy Spirit shape her life. Take her, Good Shepherd, into your care that she may loyally endure all opposition in this world in serving you. And Father, what we pray for Julie this morning, we want to pray for ourselves as well. We have confessed your name. Oh God, may we never cease to wonder at what you have done for us. Help us always to be amazed at your works, at your love. And help each one of us to continue firmly in the Christian faith, to bear witness to your love, to let the Holy Spirit shape our lives. O oh, good shepherd, take us each one into your care that we may loyally endure opposition in serving you and serving you alone in our world. And now, Lord, I was handed a few needs here. A prayer for in a Grand Rapids hospital, a son, brother of... He's in ICU. He has a bad infection. That's turned septic. He's also running a fever. He is sedated. His wife's name is Father. We pray for that you will preserve him in life. That you will minister to his physical need. That you will raise him up again, our humble prayer. And then it was mentioned, moving to the oaks. We pray that you'll be with this brother, O oh God. May his recovery and rehab continue there. His name was mentioned. Lord, he is much in need of prayer. We commend him to your love and care. And then Tom mentioned that relative in California with a heart issue. Uh, Lord, far away, but you know the need. You know the person. We pray that you will reach down from heaven to be a helper and a healer to this one and others too, Lord. Uh, maybe there's someone here that we know is much in need of prayer. I want to pause just a moment in silence as we lift up before your throne those who need our prayers today. Concluding our prayer, O oh God, may we with all your children Live together now in the joy and power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in the hope of your coming. Amen. Amen. Our time of worship continues. We give to God this morning our financial gifts.
As I indicated, dear friends, uh, Reformation Sunday, the final Sunday of the month, and yesteryear, it seems like um, we might have a big hymn sing on Reformation Sunday or near that day. We might have a rally, uh, churches combining, a special speaker coming in. We might do this or might do that. I sense that is not so much done anymore, and that maybe is somewhat unfortunate, but... Um, this morning, I want to take a few moments to help us appreciate the faith that is ours as Reformed Christians or Reformation Christians. It is a truly remarkable, remarkable faith. I'm going to read verses from Romans chapter 5. Someone has said, if the Bible is a gold mine, if the Bible is a gold mine, the book of Romans is one of its richest, richest veins. And I like that understanding. Because this book makes it clear who we are. Who we are. Our identity. And I'm going to read from chapter 5 these verses. Therefore, since we've been now justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. That God, But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of God from Romans chapter 5. I asked a simple question this morning. Dear friends, who are we? Who are we? As those who put our faith in Jesus, who are we? How are we to understand who we are? Listen again. I have four words this morning. They all start with the letter P. So hopefully we'll remember them. The first one has to do with our position, our spiritual position. Let's understand who we are from verse Verse 1, I read again. Therefore, since we've been justified or made right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you have some understanding of what it means to be justified or made right with God through faith. Justification has to do with our status, or may I say our standing before God. You know, our status and our standing, when you think about it, that often gives us our identity, our identity. 
if you're playing football and you're the quarterback on the team, that gives you a certain status or standing to be on the honors roll or on the dean's list. That gives you a certain rank or standing. Today, to dress perhaps in a certain brand of clothes or shoes, people notice that gives you some rank or standing. To drive a certain type of car or truck or to have a certain name brand boat or whatever gives you a certain standing. Belonging to a professional association. And I could go on and on. All these things give you a And those are all things that, that you kind of earn. You earn. Financial investment company from yesteryear used to have an advertisement on TV with these words, we make money, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. We make money the old-fashioned way, we earn it. No leaning on another, no dependence of any kind, no grace, no, not at all. That was the financial philosophy of Smith, Barney, and Associates. And that was being preached, that philosophy. And that was being practiced in the church of the 16th century. Over 500 years ago now, that was being preached as, as true faith or true religion. It's something you earn. It's something you do. It's something that God will reward you for. If you do it right, you're standing with God. You must earn that. Salvation by grace? No, no, no. No, it's salvation through what you do, how you succeed. Fact is, there was an Augustinian monk back then who fully believed that he was trying his level best to meet God's approval. His name was Martin Luther. We just sang his song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Martin Luther was a religious man. He was a deeply, deeply religious man. He was a monk. He lived in a monastery. And he did everything required of him to the very best of his ability. In fact, one of his quotes in a book goes like this. He says, if ever there was a monk who could be saved by his monkery, it would have been me. It would have been me. Because Martin was one who stayed in his confessional cell a little longer than any other monk. He confessed every sin imaginable. It drove the other monks crazy. They wondered why he was staying in that cell so long because seemingly a monk could only sin so much. Was he coveting perhaps in other monks' food? Or had he been daydreaming a bit, daydreaming in, in chapel? Might it be that he had a lustful thought? They all wondered, what's he in that confessional cell so long for, doing his confessions? But Martin Luther was there because of guilt, gut-wrenching, wretched guilt that he felt in his soul. You see, he was one who took the law seriously and God's law seriously. He had been a lawyer before he became a monk. And the laws of God drove him crazy. He could never measure up. He could never do them well enough. He was never good enough. And he was always haunted by the fact that no matter how hard he tried, God was yet angry with him, displeased with his performance, his level of obedience. And it led, as he said in his writings, to sleepless nights, nightmarish visions, guilt, guilt, guilt. And then Martin Luther did something as he shares in his autobiography, that was really quite dangerous. He took a copy of the Bible. He began to read what was in the Bible. And he made a stunning discovery that those who are right with God, those who are accepted by God, are right with God through faith. Through faith. With God... Your worth does not depend on your performance 
or your obedience. At least not yours. His worth depended on the performance, the obedience, the righteousness of another one, namely Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, God's son. He was the righteous one. And he had a saving righteousness that you could not earn, but you could receive it as a gift from him when you placed your trust and your faith in him. It's something you would inherit, the righteousness of another. That was the scriptural idea, Romans 3, verse 21. A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, a righteousness from God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And Martin Luther believed that. He put his trust in Jesus. And as he said, when he did that, when he did that, it was like the sun came out in the middle of the night. These are his words. The door of paradise opened wide, and I walked through. The door of paradise opened wide, I walked through. What a standing What a position to have, to receive by grace through faith. A sinful human being he was, and he still was, but now one who was fully righteous in Christ, robed in his righteousness, dressed in his righteousness. One who was justified, fully accepted by God, innocent. Dear friend, if you put your faith in Jesus, as Julie did this morning, and I think you had the words, he wipes the slate clean. You sinned, you will sin, we all will. And we can live with regret, and we can live with remorse, and we do, but God forbid, having put our faith in Jesus, that we live with guilt, with guilt, because in Christ... We are righteous, acceptable for God. One day we're going to stand in the judgment, and he's going to judge us not on our own performance, but on the performance of his son, Jesus, the one who perfectly obeyed God. We'll be dressed in his righteousness. We belong to him. We are his. A new position. Because of that, I want to suggest we have something amazing to sing about and to smile about because we have a remarkable Christian faith that gives us a very, very good position and identity. But I must move along quickly here. There's a spiritual possession we read about in Romans 5. The second P word goes along with this It's the gift of peace. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, listen, we have now peace with God, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10 I read, we were at one time enemies of God, enemies. God was angry with us. We were living under condemnation. God was preparing eternal punishment for all those who were disobedient and sinful, but not anymore. We've been justified. We're now his sons and daughters. We are his friends. We are his beloved. We've been reconciled to him. Hallelujah. And that being true, that being true, we can live differently. Martin Luther writes in his autobiography how there was a total lack of peace in his life before he became right with God, before he became justified through faith. Far too much anxiety and fear and restlessness. Once he became a Christian believer, says he, one justified right with God, he could sleep better. And he did. His whole demeanor changed. The Christian faith, you see, is a remarkable faith. The Reformation faith. I want to say this morning, if you really want to know contentment, deep down contentment, if you want to know security, if you want to know happiness in the core of your being, if you want to know a peace that passes all understanding, these kinds of possessions, then you need to know Jesus, who he is, what he's done for you. 
And you need to confess him as your savior, your sin bearer. You need to stand in grace, faith in Christ. I firmly believe faith in Christ, placed in Christ, helps a person to sleep better, to smile more, to sing a bit more, to whistle a bit louder. Anne Murray writes in one of her songs, there's a peace, there's a joy in my heart now that the world never gave me, and the world cannot take it away either. The world didn't give it to me, and the world cannot remove it from me. Annie was right. She was so right. A new spiritual position that leads to a new spiritual possession. Peace. Peace. And it also leads to a new spiritual prospect. That's the third P word. Listen. Having been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice as we look ahead to sharing one day in the glory of God. Let's understand, that is why we were given life. That's why God made us, created us, each and every one. He made us, as one writer said, for himself, for himself. He wanted us, each one, to enjoy him forever, to share in his everlasting glory, that hope, that promise, that future. It was taken away from us when our first parents sinned. We've all inherited that sin. But it's been restored to us now in Christ. The prospect, even the promise of glory, eternal glory. One day living in a sin-free world and all sin being removed from us. I don't have time to describe all of that. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says it well. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. The mind of man cannot conceive or comprehend what God is making ready for those who love him, who put their faith in Jesus. C.S. Lewis put it this way. One day we're going to be overcome or we're going to be surprised by joy. Joy. The prospect when we see enter into glory. 1 John 5 says, this is the testimony, this is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. I think back to that pre-Reformation, before the Reformation happened some 500 years ago. There were so many religious people, deeply religious people, so sincere in what they believed, but they were being misled by the church. They were being deceived. The church was saying, it's not really faith in Christ, but it's faith in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. Now we can all be deceived. And I suspect in one way or another we have. There are some stories of people who had financial investors, and it sounded so good but it was somewhat of a fraud. You deceived. That's painful. That's painful. I've listened to people who were misled by a doctor who should have known better. They were deceived. Or by a salesperson. They were taken in. Or maybe even by a friend or a family member. They were betrayed by one that they trusted. And I could go on. But I want to say, there's no deception that is more serious than being spiritually, spiritually deceived. Only those who are justified by the blood of the Lamb, only those will be standing one day in glory. You understand the recovery of the gospel in the 16th century, what was at stake? Not our financial well-being, not our earthly health, something far more 
important. The eternal placement of our soul was at stake. Had the Reformation not happened, we might be among those yet deceived, religious but deceived. We might miss out on sharing in the everlasting glory of our God. So humbly thank God today and celebrate with hope the future that is ours that is so bright, so bright and so inviting, may I say. We have a remarkable faith, an amazing gospel. Our position, our possession, our prospect. One more P and then I'll say amen. Verse 3, not only so, but we rejoice also in our sufferings. Yes, even in our sufferings. Because we know, and then the reasons are given, why we do this. We know good things come out of bad experiences and happenings. Suffering produces perseverance, produces character, produces hope. The fact is we're better, we're richer, we're deeper people because of sufferings and trials. I think, Julie, you are wanting to say that. Your life hasn't been easy. But through that, you've grown. Become a stronger person, a better person. The Bible says that when we are weak, we are strong. When we're poor, we are yet rich. When we have nothing, by faith, we can lay claim to everything. I read this statement. Living in this world with Christ and with suffering, we are ever so much better off than living in this world without suffering and without Christ. Living in our world with suffering, living in our world with suffering, with Christ, we are ever so much better off than living in this world without suffering, without Christ. The people you genuinely have to feel sorry for today are people who may have wonderful health and great savings and a prosperous life, but they have no faith, not in Jesus. There's nobody I feel more sorry for than those people. When Martin Luther became a Christian, the year was 1521, he was asked to renounce his faith. He was ordered to do that before the German emperor. A refusal, he was told, would bring great suffering to him, maybe even execution. And who would want to do that? He was but 38 years old in year 1521. Who would want to die? But maybe you know his words, his response. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against my conscience is neither right nor would it be safe. To go against my conscience, what I know to be right, is neither right nor would it be safe. For Martin Luther, there was something far more important. Something more dangerous than suffering. To live apart from Christ, to be separated from God. Then he would have no spiritual position. Then he would have no spiritual possession, peace. Then he would have no spiritual prospect for life beyond this life, for sharing in the glory of God. So we rejoice, yes, even in our sufferings as God's children because God is at work to form. And one day all sufferings, all sufferings will end. We're going to conclude with that song this morning. Oh, what a day. What a day that's going to be. 
no trial, no pain, no suffering ever again. In this world, we may maybe lose our job. Or maybe we may lose our health. Or we may lose our savings. Or we may lose this or that. But if it is well with your soul, then you're a person amazingly blessed because we have a remarkable Christian faith. Amen? Amen. Join me in prayer. Lord, we bless you for many good things this morning, but supremely do we bless you for our remarkable Christian faith and for the Reformation, for those Reformers who restored to the church once again a true faith in Jesus Christ as the one and only way to salvation so that we could find the full forgiveness of sins in Him and find life everlasting. Oh God, if it is well with our soul this morning, we put our faith in Christ. Help us to appreciate anew just how blessed we are. And help us to rejoice and live with a joy day by day and a hope in Christ's name. Amen. The hymn, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you've taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. Would you stand please to say I trust it is well with your soul. 
And if it's well with your soul, have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his smile towards you and give you his peace on this day, his joy in this new week. Amen. And if it's well with your soul, there is coming an amazing, amazing day. Let's sing about it. that refrain what